what in your view is the heart of the Lord for how Jewish believers in Jesus and Yeshua and non-Jewish Gentile Christians are to interact. This unity that's not forcing a certain type of uniformity. It's a oneness that has within it diversity and it reminds me very much of God's nature. That God is one and yet there's this mysterious diversity. Well, welcome back to another episode of A Jew and a Gentile Discuss. I'm your host, Ezra Benjamin. And I'm Carly Berna. And we are, respectively, a Jew and a Gentile who both share something very important in common. We believe that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Jewish Messiah. And we believe that God is doing something unique among Israel and the Jewish people around the world. And we also believe that that affects Christians who may be listening today. So we want to share from the headlines as well as from the scriptures and get you informed about what on earth God is up to among Israel and the Jewish people and what that has to do with believers, Jew and Gentile alike, here in the United States and around the world. So today we're going to do uh, part one of what's really a two-part, and I expect Carly will become more than a two-part series, interviewing the leaders of Messianic Jewish congregations. Uh, So we're going coast to coast. This week, we're going to start in North Carolina on the Atlantic coast. And then next week, you'll be hearing from a Messianic uh, leader uh, in Seattle area on the other side of the country. But first, the East. Everything begins in the East. So uh, today, we're interviewing Rabbi Seth Klayman, who leads Sharei Shalom Messianic Congregation in the Raleigh-Durham area in North Carolina. Let's jump right in and discuss. Seth, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. You are a second generation Jewish believer. And what we mean by that is, as we understand it, your parents were the first in their family as Jewish people to come to faith in Jesus. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your own background and how your parents' faith affected your kind, your your life and your journey. Sure. Both of my parents are Jewish and both of my parents grew up in Jewish homes with strong Jewish identities very different. My father comes from more of a modern Orthodox background. He grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. My mother from a reform or reconstructionist type Jewish background from Long Island, New York. And both of them uh, in their, uh, my mother in her late teens, my father in her twenties began searching for truth. My father's search took him through all sorts of endeavors uh, from uh, all different sports to uh, education uh, to other uh, less honorable uh, pursuits. My father, uh, my mother uh, was involved in activism in the late 1960s, uh, seeking to make the world a a better place. And uh, it's through that search and struggle that both of them encountered Yeshua in different ways. My father, while he was uh, backpacking through Finland uh, uh, and lost in a woods, called on the God of his ancestors, and that call was met by a revelation of Yeshua. Uh, My mother, through various challenges in her life and having met uh, believer, Jewish believers in Yeshua in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, moved from an atheist to believing in God to believing that Yeshua is the Messiah. And so they uh, began their life together uh, as Jewish followers of Yeshua, without coaching and uh, without a lot of theological training, opened up the pages of the New Testament and found that Jesus is Jewish, that all of his disciples are Jewish. They found Jewish names, Jewish holidays, Jewish institutions, and they never saw uh, anyone Uh, in the New Testament, abandoning that identity. And so they were a part of that pioneering generation uh, that sought to build a Jewish expression of faith in Yeshua in modern times. I grew up in that context, a Messianic Jewish synagogue, uh, of course, all of our wider family, uh, uh, Jewish, and uh, uh, apart from my dad's brother's family, uh, no other followers of Yeshua uh, in, in our family. I grew up where uh, our identity as Jews and Yeshua as the foundation of our our faith in our home were central. And of course, as I grew into my teenage years, 
Um, we all come to a point where we need to make some decisions on our own. My parents very involved in the Messianic Jewish community, and I came to a place where I had to ask, apart from my parents and whatever direction they've gone or chosen, what about myself? And uh, it was in my late uh, teenage years that I, uh, what, what I would, the way I describe it is appropriated faith in Yeshua for myself. I always believed in God, knew I was a Jew, trusted Yeshua at a very young age, but I appropriated it there in my late teens. And the course of my life from there took me uh, through education and uh, into uh, Messianic Jewish ministry. It's great. Before Carly picks up, I want to ask one just follow-up question there. So you, your immediate family is is are, were the only believers in your extended family on either side. Tell us about maybe one of the more difficult moments you remember growing up in terms of your your immediate family's faith kind of colliding with the the history and the practices of your larger family. Thankfully, I think that in my younger years, I was somewhat uh, shielded from some challenges that uh, my parents experienced with their own parents. For example, when my father became a believer in Yeshua, uh, he wrote to his parents telling him of his newfound faith and that he had in fact found the Jewish Messiah. And their response was, well, then you're not welcome to come home, uh, that sort of thing. By the time I came around, thankfully, the relationship was generally positive. I have good memories of my grandparents. However, there was a certain awkwardness. It was something that uh, it was very clear shouldn't be talked about uh, when we were together, uh, number one. And number two, I can remember uh, even in high school writing a paper in school about the resurrection of Yeshua and my grandfather reading that paper and uh, coming to me with some some challenges uh, to my argument in the paper and and having a bit of a discussion there about it. Uh, that was the extent of it from my sort of child's eye vantage point. But, uh, but uh, and I'm grateful to have had very positive relationships with my, my wider family. So as you mentioned, you, you did grow up in a Messianic Jewish congregation. And then at some point, you know, you had your own testimony of faith when it became your own instead of just your parents. What does it look like for you to honor your parents' legacy? Honoring my parents' legacy uh, is, uh, number one, I think um, being planted on the foundation of, of some of the core values that they and so many other women and men in uh, their generation uh, laid down for us as a community. Uh, that absolutely being Jewish and following Yeshua uh, are consistent with one another, uh, that it makes good sense, that scripturally speaking, it's good theology, uh, that, there, that it's important that there are communities where that faith and identity can be lived out on the ground. And those are what I would consider sort of core essentials. Now, of course, in terms of practice, I think there's there's quite a spectrum and there's leeway in terms of uh, what a service looks like, what holiday observances look like, uh, the, the spectrum of observance within the home environment, uh, for example, um, issues uh, that we're engaging in the world, uh, what we're choosing to prioritize in our engagement in making the world a better place as we shine uh, a, a light for Yeshua. So I think there's there can be a lot of room for uh, different uh, nuances of calling, so to speak, in all of these different areas. Uh, but to me, uh, my parents and so many others really set that foundation in place in a very solid way. And I think that uh, we see in the wider community of Messiah Yeshua, so many more people than 10 and 20 and certainly 30 and 40 years ago, recognizing that Yeshua belongs with his Jewish people and his Jewish people belong with him. Uh, and we're even seeing more and more recognition of this, I think, in the wider Jewish non-Yeshua believing community. Of course, it's still very delicate and we still have our uh, challenges there. But 
I think if we compare from a decade or a few decades ago, we're certainly seeing a greater openness uh, to considering uh, an authentic expression of Yeshua faith among Jewish people and in Jewish community. That's great. And Rabbi Seth, speaking of authentic expressions, you're now involved in, well, more than involved, you're leading uh, a Messianic Jewish congregation, a, a weekly and an ongoing community expression of that Jewish faith, Jewish lifestyle, Jewish worship. So uh, you're not only saying people should do it, you're doing it and you're leading others in doing the same. Tell us about how you uh, came to lead a Messianic Jewish congregation from growing up in one to uh, now now being at the helm of one. Once I began to follow Yeshua on my own at 16 or 17, uh, I really determined in my early years of college that whatever path I took um, serving the Lord and uh, representing Yeshua would be my primary endeavor. And if you would have asked me in college, <clears throat> for example, would I like to be quote unquote in ministry? Would I like to lead a, a, a congregation? I would have said, and I did say to a number of people, that would be amazing. That would be incredible. But I would have to know that I know that I know that there, the call is there. In other words, that, that, that there's a sense of conviction in my heart that I believe to the core of my being is planted there by God. And if, and if that's there, wonderful. I actually set out on a path in school to uh, be a professor of Jewish studies. I noticed when I switched my major to Jewish studies as an undergraduate that in Jewish studies programs uh, in, in my university, which was the Ohio State University, and everywhere else I looked around the country, I did not see believers in Yeshua in Jewish studies departments. And, and, and it really, really intrigued me uh, to pursue higher education uh, that I might be a, a Messianic Jewish presence within Jewish studies um, scholarship. And so that was my path. That, that took me to uh, England for graduate studies at Oxford after university. That took me uh, to Israel for studies uh, for a year. That took me uh, here to North Carolina originally to Duke University for an MA and PhD. And along the course of that, that path to becoming a professor in Jewish studies that deep sense of conviction uh, arrived, and I could do uh, for for moving into ministry as my primary uh, endeavor. And so I, there was nothing I could do uh, once that was planted there, but follow that sense of call and, and conviction. And so that that's what uh, brought us into uh, leadership. Uh, in Messianic Jewish ministry, and specifically here at Share Shalom. Fantastic. So speaking of the name, Share Shalom, firstly, unpack the Hebrew for our predominantly American English speaking audience, and then tell us about the, the, the significance of that name, why that name, and uh, how does that reflect the, the purpose of your congregation? Share Shalom means simply gates of peace. And uh, for us here as a community, um, God's shalom and what he's done in our hearts and lives uh, through Messiah Yeshua, what he's doing in the world uh, through, through Messiah Yeshua is uh, certainly uh, what, we're, what we're all about. Um, our desire is that when people walk through our doors and here as a Messianic Jewish community, our, we're primarily geared uh, to Jewish people who are curious about Yeshua, uh, asking questions about Yeshua, uh, to uh, families with uh, Jewish members who are seeking to live out and walk out their identity and community, as well as uh, people who are not Jewish but have a particular uh, sense of call to be among and with a Messianic Jewish community. So uh, we're oriented uh, toward these uh, these individuals and families, and and just in all that we do, uh, we're seeking to to spread the shalom that we find 
uh, God uh, that that it, that is uh, characterizes the kingdom, and that God is bringing down here to earth more and more and more as get, days go by. That's great. Can you tell us what kind of people are part of your congregation, younger, older? What are their backgrounds? Yeah, so we have a, a, a pretty um, diverse demographic within our community, I think. Um, we have, uh, first of all, a, a, a good, solid um, diversity of Jews and Gentiles together. Uh, 40-some percent of our families are Jewish, meaning there's one Jewish member of, of the family at least. Um, we have uh, a, a pretty uh, good balance, I think, across the generations, perhaps a, a bit more weighted toward the younger uh, uh, generation than a number of Messianic Jewish communities. Uh, sometimes, as you as you likely know, that that happens just by the function of um, the the age of the leader and leadership and that sort of thing. I I became the uh, rabbi of the congregation at, at 28 or 29 years old, so um, started off fairly young, relatively speaking, in in leadership in a congregation. So I think, in some senses, it may may follow that. Although I'm not. Uh, not as young, you know, as I was uh, at that time. That was about 15 years ago. So, um, so I think that uh, we have a, a good uh, a good uh, mix within our our community. So, like Ezra said, a lot of our audience are Christians. Um, talk to specifically our Christian audience. Why should they be involved in a Messianic congregation? And if they want to be, what's the first step? Well, I think that uh, first of all, um, one sh coming from uh, Christians uh, should be involved uh, where they feel called. Of course, that's the case with with any follower of Yeshua. Um, we we actually are uh, say very clearly that um, we're not a, a congregation that thinks we're uh, better than. Uh, the uh, the church uh, down the road that we're not in competition uh, with churches whatsoever. In fact, we're on the same team. Uh, we love to talk about the body of the Messiah and the different essential parts of that body. And uh, we like to say that you know we're we're the the Jewish expression. We're the remnant of Israel within the community of Messiah, and we do think that that we um, are. Uh, we explore and um, we we focus on some things that, historically speaking, the the church has missed, namely God's enduring covenant with the Jewish people, um, you know, uh, and uh, and things related to that that important. Um, aspect of the Bible and our faith, um, but that there are other uh, communities and churches and denominations uh, that uh, that have great value and, and strengths that we don't have as a community. And so that's why I say it's very much a sense, sense of call. Uh, we like to say to believers in Jesus who are um, not from a Jewish background that um, a, a call in a long-term sense to Shari Shalom means that one should have a Ruth-like calling. In other words, um, of course, everybody is open and we're always happy to to um, welcome guests and visitors uh, from uh, churches for uh, holidays and different events that we do. But if one is really going to plant here uh, in our community, uh, there, there should really be a strong sense of uh, being called to live among the Jewish people. It's not a conversion, uh, of course, um, but it is a, a deep commitment and a walking with over a long term. And, and, and that can come into the lives of people who are not Jewish, you know, in, in, in different, uh, different ways. It might be in terms of wanting to grow in being a, 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 a testimony for Yeshua among the Jewish people, uh, maybe uh, being a, a, a support for, for Israel. Um, in, in any number of different ways, but, but certainly something that runs deep and, and, and is unique. We, we don't expect 
that, that every Christian uh, would have such a call by any stretch. In fact, we would see it as the exception uh, that someone from a non-Jewish background would be called to plant here, just as we would see it perhaps as the exception uh, that a Jewish person would be called to, to plant uh, in the church. Of course, that happens. There are many, many Jewish believers in, in Jesus in the churches, and uh and, and so we would say, we would just challenge Jewish believers in Yeshua to ask the question, is that my call? And it very well may be the call of a Jewish Jewish believer in Yeshua uh, to a particular ministry in a church context, uh, but it also, uh, you know, may, may be to, to be in a place um, more rooted in uh, heritage and, and background as a Jew. So that's a good point. As a Christian, I might be asking, you know, why can't... Why can't a Jewish person just go to a church? Why, why does there have to be such a thing as a Messianic Jewish congregation? What would you say to a Christian who asked that? I would say that a Jewish person certainly can go to a church, and I can think of a number of instances where that is absolutely the right place for that Jewish believer in Jesus to plant. And, and one would be a sense of, of calling. Uh, if I'm called to a particular community, be it in an urban setting or a rural setting, uh, you know, or internationally, uh, any number of things, then then that's the right right place to be. There are certainly places where um, a vi viable and a healthy Messianic Jewish synagogue is simply not um, an option. And uh, in that case, I, I think it's it's certainly uh, very, the right thing to be planted in a solid community of Yeshua believers while also seeking to um, live out, uh, you know, a God-given identity as a Jew in ways that are possible in, in whatever location. Uh, so I think that those are certainly, um, certainly uh, valid uh, and right uh, motivations and reasons. Um, but I think that at the same time, sometimes a Jewish believer in Jesus uh, may keep a Messianic Jewish synagogue at arm's length for reasons such as this. I had a bad experience growing up in temple. Uh, I, I found the uh, Hebrew prayers uh relatively meaningless. I didn't understand what I was saying. Uh, I didn't understand why uh, people's lives didn't seem to reflect what I was seeing in the Torah, in my home environment or whatever. Uh, granted, these can happen within churches as well, seeing seeing this is not something that's unique to uh, uh, Judaism or, or, or any religion for that matter. Um, but these are all reasons. And, 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 and sometimes I think it's healthy for um for a Jewish follower of Yeshua to, to think about that. Well, why? You know, um, if there is a healthy uh, Messianic Jewish synagogue uh, within your community, um, maybe there's some some issues or questions um, that that God would desire that you work through um, be, uh, because maybe, uh, there can be a lot of renewal in a Messianic Jewish context uh, through, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a reconnection with uh, heritage and with the, the prayers, for example, that have historically uh, sustained our people. And of course, it, it comes along with Yeshua, you know, uh, right at the center of, of all that we're doing. So, so what are one's motivations for staying away? I think that that's a, that's a good question to ask if that's relevant to someone. And then kind of a third group, uh, Rabbi Seth, you know, we've had some people listening to our podcast actually contact Carly and I. The, the questions are somewhat along the lines of this. I don't have any experience with anything messianic. I'm perfectly happy in the church that I'm in, but my parents or grandparents uh, have a Jewish background, and I'm trying to understand what that might mean for me. And I'm not really sure because I'm very happy where I'm at. And, you know, we've had uh, I can think of a couple um, communications we've received here since we started this podcast and the Barna survey. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, look it up. There was a Barna survey on American Christianity, and they defined that very broadly. The Catholic Church, the evangelical, uh, very liturgical or more informal or mainline expressions. But uh, Rabbi Seth, one of the stats that came out of that, particularly interesting to us here at A Jew and a Gentile Discuss, 
is by extrapolation, the survey concluded that there may be as many as 945,000 Christians in the American church who would define themselves as Christians who actually have Jewish parents or grandparents. So speak to one of those people who's maybe listening to the podcast today. They didn't have a bad experience in the Messianic community growing up. They have no experience with anything Messianic, but they're trying to figure out what are the next steps for me with this Jewish background. I think that uh, in that case, I would point out that your, your heritage is not an accident, that God-given identity is important, that it's not a a war or a competition, or there's no pressure or anything like this to to abandon one side or aspect of your heritage or identity, but that uh, if there's one thing that we find consistently throughout the scriptures, uh, it's that that enduring covenant that God makes uh, with Israel uh, is important. It's not uh, doesn't make a, a Jewish person better than another person. We're not in the realm of hierarchy here, ranking, um, but we are in the realm of of a role, calling, uh, responsibility, these sorts of things. And I think that that's worth exploring. Um, and what that means to be a member of a of a people, uh, specifically the Jewish people, I would not get concerned about. Does this mean that um, now it's wrong for me, or I cannot celebrate uh, uh, Christmas or something like that? I wouldn't. I wouldn't get wrapped up in worrying about those questions whatsoever. Um, I I would simply explore the question: What does it mean? to be a Jew or to, to have Jewish heritage and how am I called to walk and to live that out? And I think there are responsible uh, teachers, uh, Christian teachers, Messianic Jewish teachers uh, who can really uh, help and, and give some, some guidance there. That's great. So uh, you mentioned that your congregation is, is a, is a diverse expression, both of Jewish people or, uh, and, and non-Jewish people who are all committed to this Jewish lifestyle, Jewish worship. Uh, what, in your view, is the heart of the Lord for how Jewish believers in Jesus and Yeshua and non-Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians, are to interact? What's, what's the big idea here? We see in the scriptures, of course, that God's heart was for the whole world. He loved the whole world so much that he gave his only begotten son, Yeshua, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, um, what, what's, what's the big idea? What's the end game here in terms of the interaction between both groups? I think the big idea is that we express our God given diversity, uh, in a way that brings mutual blessing to one another and that results in a oneness between Jew and Gentile in the Messiah that really causes the Jewish world and the nations to take note. There is something different here. You know, even with the people in our congregation who are from a non-Jewish background, we don't encourage them to uh, abandon their own identity and heritage. Uh, we don't encourage them to now say they're Jewish, for example. We actually feel that to have diversity within our congregation uh, that, a, that, that brings mutual blessing is a, is a very strong testimony to who Yeshua is. We're not trying to make you like us in terms of identity and practice in every way. And, 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 and I think that when we talk about the Messianic Jewish communities, interrelationship with the wider church, uh, it's, it's a very similar idea that um, we are, what, what makes us a quote unquote, one new man or humanity? Um, it's, it's not that we're asking Christians to now, uh, you know, throw out the wonderful, bright uh, parts of, of uh, historic Christianity. 
Christianity and, and personal heritages and among different peoples and, and, and groups and nations, you know, and cultural um, uh, practices that are that are consistent with the scriptures and that are enriching. No, we we love that. we love that. Uh, and and to, and together uh, in a oneness with the Jewish community, believers from a, among the nations are we we can really live out something new. The thing that's new about the one new man or humanity is, is that it is this unity that's not forcing a certain type of uniformity. It's a oneness. Uh, and it's a oneness that has within it diversity, and it reminds me very much of God's nature, that, that God is one, and yet there's this mysterious diversity. It begins with God, you know, and, and, and we're called to sort of be an expression of this uh, unique and mysterious yet profound and very compelling uh, oneness as members of Yeshua's body. So good. The Lord's heart is for unity, not for uniformity. Rabbi Seth, thanks so much for interviewing with us. We have one more kind of lighter question for you. Uh, before we do that, I just want to speak to our audience real quick. You know, in in difficult times, like the season we're in as a nation right now, in times of uncertainty with COVID and with uh, exploring issues of racial injustice and reconciliation and everything on the table and uh, peace or lack thereof in the Middle East, one thing we're still committed to doing, even in times like this, is to reaching out to Jewish people and being a blessing to them meeting practical needs in order to earn the right to share what's most important to us and that is jew and gentile alike our faith in jesus our faith in yeshua both the jewish messiah promised to the house of israel for our salvation and our redemption and also the savior and the hope of all tribes tongues and nations and if you want to partner with us in partnering with ministries like Jewish Voice and like so many dozens of others actually over a hundred others in israel and in the nations uh, get involved. The details are on our website at jewandagentiledisgust.org. As a thank you for your partnership, we do have some delicious Ethiopian coffee to send to you, not just because it's delicious and not just because uh, Ezra drinks several pots of it a day. Uh, I'm somewhat ashamed to say, but I don't plan on stopping, but also because it's a great reminder uh, of one of the communities near and dear to our hearts, the Ethiopian Jewish community. Uh, heavily persecuted, heavily isolated. Many have returned to Israel, but tens of thousands, literally tens of thousands who we've met and ministered among remain uh, in Ethiopia suffering for their Jewish identity. And so if you have a burden as you're listening to us and uh, listening to this podcast and the others in our series uh, to get involved with uh, what God's doing with Israel and the Jewish people, check out the details on the website again, a Jew and a Gentile discuss. Dot org, and we'd love to send you some delicious Ethiopian coffee as a thank you for your support. So Carly, uh, take it away here. Light segment to end our time with Rabbi Seth. So thanks for sharing everything you have about Messianic Jewish congregations. The question we want to ask you is, what is your favorite Jewish holiday and why? Well, it's a light question, and my answer might be a heavier answer. I like Yom Kippur. I love Yom Kippur. Uh, to me, when we gather together on Yom Kippur, uh, there is such a sense of awe, uh, such a sense of the, the profound seriousness of, of being in the presence of God. Of course, these are things that we should always have in our worship experience, um, but the atmosphere on Yom Kippur, uh, everything's different uh, in our community. People are not wearing leather often, their shoes are off, um, uh, wearing a, an article of, of white. Of course, we haven't eaten, uh, you know, hadn't, haven't had anything to drink, and, and so there's nothing you can do but just take in the, the words of the prayers and, and, and to put out the words of the prayers and the songs and uh, to just be there with the word. We're there together all day uh, with having scripture studies in the afternoon. And uh, I, of course, the times of joy and rejoicing and dancing and jumping are awesome. And, and I love them. And we do that Sukkot and Simchat Torah and Hanukkah and 
and those are all wonderful. Uh, but at Yom Kippur, uh, and when we have many, many visitors, Jewish people who are not followers of Yeshua, and uh, maybe it's their first time or they're very rarely in our community, uh, to see them there, uh, these, these things are, are just very memorable to me each and every year. So I choose Yom Kippur. Well, that makes sense. I think Ezra actually shared a similar thought, except for the fact that he doesn't drink coffee on Yom Kippur, which is basically like the worst thing for him. It's the affliction of my soul, according to the scripture. So. <laughs> well, thanks again so much for joining us, Rabbi Seth. Uh, and to our audience, thanks for listening. If you want to hear more episodes of A Jew and a Gentile Discuss, subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We'd also love if you leave us a review, share this podcast with someone you know. You can follow us on social media at the handle a Jew and a Gentile discuss. Um, if you want to have us answer any questions, share those, give us your feedback. Thanks again for listening and join us next week for another episode. This show is a production of Jewish Voice Ministries International.